Okay, so first things first, if you haven't seen my review of the previous game in the Klonoa series, that is Klonoa Daughter to Phantom Isle, please do check that one out, as it will offer a lot of additional sort of subtext that you can take with you into this one. I will also place a warning when there's going to be any spoilers for this game, however I do ultimately recommend you play the game first. Form your own opinion, don't let mine influence yours. Wait, why am I sending my viewership away? This isn't gonna get many views as it is. It doesn't matter. Let's talk about Klonoa 2, Lunatea's Veil. Vale. Stop. Right. You didn't seriously think I was just gonna let you watch the rest of this video without you paying your dues. Oh, you've, you've subscribed, have you? Well, that's good and all, but I think the least you could do is also like the video, eh? Come on, pay up. And speaking of paying up, there's no way to even jokingly act entitled about this. It would mean the world to me if you would check out the Patreon link in the description below and consider making a monthly pledge. It helps me get this content out there and it just makes me very happy. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> that first game, Klonoa Daughter Phantom Isle, was a difficult act to follow. This otherwise unsuspecting looking little platformer ended up having a lot more layers to it than I'd ever expected. And, you know, there's a lot of themes to it and a lot of twists and turns. And, like, yeah, I did not see those things coming. It was a game where I was, yeah, enticed by just the basis of it and just the overall platforming nature and the great gameplay and just the endearing little world of Klonoa. And Klonoa himself is just very endearing. But peeling back the guise of the mascot platformer, I got so much more than I bargained for out of that game. So how do you make a sequel to that that will measure up? You can't really repeat those moments and expect them to be just as effective. And fortunately, Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil vale knows better than to try that, and instead opts to blaze its own trails. But at the same time, those twists and themes from that first game managed to stay just as important to this one as they did the first time around. Klonoa's destiny as a dream traveler that comes and goes from world to world is something that has been accepted by Klonoa this time around. What once ripped this poor little Cabot's heart to shreds in the previous game is now just kind of a part of his life. This is an older, more mature, more experienced Klonoa, and he is now supporting a design that reflects that. No, I don't think he's like a grown adult or anything, but he is definitely older and more mature than he was the first time around. Now, this redesign, yes, it does reflect that, but I do think they could have kept a few more elements of that previous design than they did. It's the eyes, man. They've gone for more the Sonic-style eyes, when I, I definitely like the sort of cat eyes that the previous one had. Look, bottom line, Klonoa Noah is an adorable animal, and I think that first design conveys that a little better. I, I definitely find him to be more appealing, but this does fit the bill. It's still a good design, and they made it purposeful, which is which is great. I miss the collar man. I just I have the head cannon that he's someone's pet, but he is more equipped for different weather, being as he's finally learned how to wear a shirt. He's no longer banjo bear in it. So Klonoa is summoned to the world of Lunatea, and he's following the sound of a distressed voice calling for his help. His unconscious little key still lands in the Sea of Tears, where he's discovered by Sky Pirates Leona and Tat, who want to use Klonoa's ring to to ring the bells of the four kingdoms in order to collect their respective elements and use it to reshape the world of Lunatea. However, they are intercepted by Lolo and Popka, who determine that with Klonoa's help, they need to collect the elements before Leona and Tat can get their grubby hands on them. Now, Lolo is the very center of this story and Klonoa takes a more of a supporting role. But like Hupo before her, Lolo is able to inhabit Klonoa's ring, allowing him the power of the wind bullet which can be used to ring the bells. However, these bells can only be rung by a priestess, a priestess which Lolo is training to be. But because she's occupying the ring, she's effectively ringing the bells, she is granted the rank of priestess. However, she doesn't feel like she's really earned it, and she's got quite a few self-image problems, which Klonoa kind of wants to help her overcome. And let me just say, I am so proud of the guy that Klonoa has grown to be. Yeah, he's still a total airhead with only a single brain cell, but the dude has so much heart. He's so kind and gentle, and you can kind of tell that he's been through a lot. Then there's Popka. Huh. He looks kind of familiar, doesn't he? He's kind of your wild card side character. He's the comic relief. But he is more than just that as well. He is like a longtime friend of Lolo's. He's much more familiar with her than Klonoa is. And yeah, he's able to give her a good pep talk or two. Lolo's a very sensitive character, and I think Popka is great opposite her. As well as that, though, it is nice seeing his dynamic with Klonoa as well. Klonoa, who's sort of very mature, very calm, whereas you've got Popka, who's a total hothead. This is a comic relief done right, and Leona as well. Like, she's got her own comic relief character too, with Tat 
who high key wants to bone Klonoa's brains out, I think. Either that or cancel him, I, I don't know. But with a bigger cast and a bigger quest, Klonoa 2 definitely brings the laughs. I definitely found this one to be a little more funny than Door to Phantom R was. That said, I, I did enjoy the humor in Door to Phantom R 2, but this one felt a bit more, I, I don't know, cinematic in the way it used its comedy. It feels like a big action adventure. And on that foundational basis, it absolutely succeeds. I, I think, you know, as like a little action adventure fetch quest story, this is how you do it. Now, I won't say much more about the story until we get to the spoiler section, so for now, I'm gonna say this. If you've heard what I've said and are worried that maybe it's not going to hit the same as Klonoa 1's storyline, or that it's not gonna live up to it, play it for yourself and you will see. I can't really quantify right now why, but it is just as layered and just as clever as the first one, if not, maybe even a little more so. I will elaborate more on that when we get to the spoiler section. But let's talk gameplay and mechanics. And once again, what you are seeing in my video is from the Fantasy Reverie series version of the game, which is the new recent remaster. And unlike the previous Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle, there's only one remaster of this one, and that is the Fantasy Reverie version. And yeah, it is the same overall game, just with a slick new coat of paint. That slick new coat of paint, I would say, is absolutely better. Fantasy Reverie series version is the one to get. I'm thinking I might do a devoted review of just the Fantasy Reverie series as like a package at a later date, so I'll go more into detail there. But like, yeah, the footage you are seeing here is from that version of the game. So in terms of the basic gameplay, Klonoa plays exactly the same as he did the first time. And, and this is absolutely how you do a platformer sequel. Same overall gameplay, but with new levels and new elements that allow you to expand on that a little bit further. As I said in Door to Phantom Isle, Klonoa's abilities being jumping and firing wind bullets in different directions, yeah, they're, they're a good little base function. It's how you use the elements around you that really define how this game plays. Being able to bounce yourself off of inflated moves or throw them at other moves. That's what like most of the enemies are called, by the way, they're called moves. <laughs> I, I like it, I don't know what to tell you. But there are more sort of enemies that have different functions as well. There are some that work as like little helicopters, some that work as fireworks. Like yeah, this does add some new sort of gameplay mechanics to this experience. And yeah, these are not just purely situational, they get a lot of use. There were also like these little sort of crystal moves that change colors depending on like how many different enemies you throw it into and those are like integral parts of the puzzles. The levels are a lot bigger and more layered than before. They're a lot longer, that's for sure. However, I will say that I do think this game is paced just as well, if not a little better than the previous one. There were times, particularly between the Kingdom of Volk and Mirror Mirror, where I thought, oh geez, this level is really long. Like the Ark, for example. That's a really, really, really long level. And it's like, oh god, surely we've got a, a part two to this though, have we not? But then it's okay because part two ends up being a snowboarding stage, which is a lot quicker. And then we have another new element to the gameplay put into Klonoa Lunatea's Veil. Snowboarding stages or airboarding, I, I don't know what these are. Like, Sonic Riders move over, it's extreme gear. And it's here where we actually managed to get some 3D gameplay into the Klonoa series as well. Of course, without sacrificing that iconic 2.5D gameplay which incorporates elements from the foregrounds and backgrounds that was just so great in that first game. These boarding levels do wonders for the pacing of this game and can really help to break that kind of overall tension as well. Like, it can be that you're in these really long levels and they're very challenging. And, and yeah, I would say that Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil is absolutely a more challenging game than its predecessor. So having these snowboarding stages to kind of break that up helps a lot. Also, the fact that, thank you, boss fights are now a separate act from the previous visions. Meaning that you got time to save, you got time to go off and have a soda. If you want to take a break and just, you know, jump back in right at the boss fight, you absolutely can. Thank you. That was my biggest criticism of the previous game. And like, again, uh, the pacing of this one, lot better. Once again, talking about those snowboard sections, like I, I remember in Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle, there's this stretch of just like where you've got like the Sun Kingdom and the Moon Kingdom, and like you've got these really long levels back to back, really labyrinthian in structure. Like there are four of these visions, each with their own boss fights, and in a final boss, it's like it gets very intense. Having snowboarding sections and having separate boss fights just feels a lot better. With that said, given the longer length of this one, and given the fact that I am quite an impatient ADHD riddled person, 
Yeah, I'll admit I played this one on easy mode. It's a godsend. I reckon I could have done it on medium or normal as well, to be honest, but like, just not having to worry about getting a game over screen and having to go through that entire arc level all over again. Yeah, it takes the edge off of things a little bit. Especially when it comes to stages like Vulcan Inferno, where unexpectedly, after you've beaten that boss fight, it decides to chase you through the entire town all over again. So there is a great sense of geography to Lunatea as well. Like, the world map is a lot more intricate this time than it was in Daughter Phantom Isle. Sadly, the villagers you save no longer play a song for you, but then again, the Song of Restoration isn't really a part of Lunatea's culture, so it's not re it wouldn't really have any meaning this time around. And like, yeah, the side characters you meet from kingdom to kingdom are nowhere near as memorable or as connected with the story as they were in Door to Phantom Isle. And I think that's partly by design because everyone's kind of isolated from each other in this game. Like each of these kingdoms is very much its own thing and their own culture. They don't like to cross over. It's a much more discordant place than Phantom Isle was. But I'd be lying if I said I didn't miss Corral the Fish. Again, though, this game's got different priorities. It, it's less of that sort of childhood innocence of the Klonoa Daughter Phantom. This is, this ain't your dad's Klonoa. It's a much, uh, much more edgy game. <laughs> I, I don't mean that like that, no. It's a different world with a different culture. It doesn't have the same customs, and that's, that's how this works. In terms of the visuals of this game, and let, let's divorce ourselves from the Fantasy Reverie series for this part. The Fantasy Reverie series has like a uniform art style going from Door to Phantom Isle over to Lunatea's Veil. Vale. So let's take into account that when this game came out, it was on the PlayStation 2, whereas its predecessor was on the PlayStation 1. The original Klonoa has some pretty crunchy looking environments, but they do have charm and it has these sprite-based graphics, which I said can work as an art style all of their own. If anything, they've actually aged pretty well. Graphically speaking, Klonoa 2 was a step up. I mean, you'd hope it would be. It's a sequel, but not only that, it's on a new console generation. And yeah, Klonoa 2, they don't rely on sprite graphics anymore for the characters. They've now got their own 3D models. They've got this sort of cell shaded look, which looks really cool. I don't think it's aged as well as Daughter Phantom Isle did, because with the advent of the sort of indie game and pixel art kind of becoming its very own art style, like, yeah, like, that that's fortunately aged with changing trends and indie games. Whereas, like, you don't really see many video games come out these days looking like Family Guy too hot for TV. So, like, graphically speaking, yes, it is a step up from the first game, as far as the time that this came out, you, like, if the game came out looking like Daughter to Phantom Isle at the time it came out, I don't think people would have liked it. Whereas, like, obviously, Klonoa 1 has had the good graces of having an art style that fortunately came back into fashion. Then there's the music, and everything that was really strong about the soundtrack to Daughter to Phantom Isle has been carried over here from the reoccurring themes and motifs. However, I will say I don't think it's quite as memorable as the soundtrack to Daughter to Phantom Isle. Maybe if I play it a little more, because I think I have definitely played Daughter to Phantom Isle more, because, I mean, like, just recently was my first time playing Klonoa 2, so the soundtrack isn't quite as etched into my skull as the Door to Phantom Isle soundtrack is. It's a bit more energetic this time around, though. I'll say that much, and like, the Volky song is just some toe-tapping big band jazz, but also it just really reminded me of the Spider-Man 3 Peter vs. Harry fight to the point where I had to make this edit. It might just be my own edit, but it was therapeutic making Hupo blow up. Even more so, given that Lolo proves that Hupo absolutely did not need to brainwash Klonoa into saving Phantom Isle, because Lolo just straight up asked him for help. Her world is no less in danger than Hupo's is, I'm just pointing that out. Big ups to Lolo. We say no to Hupo. Monkey girl. So overall, spoiler-free thoughts are Klonoa to Lunatea's Veil, vale, it goes absolutely hand in hand with that first game. Storyline and character wise, it's only going to be a better experience if you play that first game first. And in that regard, it honestly makes no difference which game is better. Like, not only does that first game enrich this one, this game will enrich that first one too. It's the kind of sequel that absolutely complements its predecessor while being complemented by it. 
that's how you know they put a lot of thought into this. With that said, structurally, I must say I do think that Luna Tears Veil is probably the better game. It's definitely got a better sense of pacing to it, and the new gameplay styles it brings in are absolutely welcome. It's a bigger game overall as well, so it's not like you're missing out on any more of that platforming action that we loved so much about the first game just because they've got the snowboarding and stuff in there. No, that you've got just as much of that as before, if not maybe more so, it's just a bigger game. So if you've played Door to Phantom Isle, and you haven't played Luna Tears Veil, what are you doing? Like, because this is only going to make that experience better. This completes it. These two games feel complete by themselves, sure, but when you put them together, you get an experience that I never expected. And that is what I think is so special about this. That is how I know it's such a good sequel, is the fact that you get a completely new experience playing these two games back to back. Fantastic. Klonoa is just, it's such an artistic little franchise. Such an artistic little character, and such an artistic little world, and like so much care has been put into these games. Which is also why I'm glad that this re-release has the two bundled in together, and is not just like a remaster of the first one, like the first time they did a remaster, which was just Door to Phantom Isle. No, no, this is the complete packet. Alright then, prepare your anus, because we're going into spoiler territory now. I won't warn you again. I'll warn you one more time, alright? It's spoiler territory now. Capiche? Get out of here! So each of the four kingdoms in Klonoa Lunatea's Veil vale is home to a different bell and element like I mentioned previously. However, each of these elements is based off of an aspect of the human condition, and each of these kingdoms have been made to kind of coincide with that. For example, Lake Lakusha, the Kingdom of Tranquility, a very calm, natural, and beauteous environment. Joyland, which is like a theme park dedicated entirely to joy and play. Volk, the Kingdom of Discord, no, not, not that one. These guys are constantly fighting, it's just a place where war never ends. AKA Sunset Heights from Sonic Forces. Mirror Mirror, the kingdom of indecision. Completely covered in snow, home to the maze of memories where the citizens just reflect, as opposed to actually living their lives. Which I just love that Popka refers to as old foggy stuff. <laughs> I love that guy. And obviously given that this place is all about reflection, calling it Mirror Mirror is kind of... I don't know if that's subtle or not. <laughs> but there is a fifth kingdom, drowned in the sea of tears and forgotten, Huponia, the Kingdom of Sorrow. Which is probably one of the most smartly designed environments I've seen in a video game. And this is where Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil vale, really locks in to Klonoa Daughter Phantom Isle. So at the start of the game, we do see the ring fall by the moon again. But this time Klonoa talks about forgotten dreams. And it's in the Kingdom of Huponia where we really see what that means. The Kingdom of Sorrow is the forgotten kingdom, drowned in the sea of tears. Klonoa talks about forgotten dreams. The kingdom is called Huponia. It looks like a dried up ruined version of Phantom Isle, and in the background there are tons of destroyed houses with rocking chairs in them, while scrambled reprisals of music from Door to Phantom Isle plays. didn't just forget the dream, he repressed it, losing his grandpa, saying goodbye to Hupo forever. This is his kingdom of sorrow, his 
Huponia. And just when I thought they couldn't possibly live up to the level of storytelling that the first game did, they throw this at me. This is insane. If you haven't played Klonoa 1, if you haven't played Daughter Phantom Earl, this will just seem like ruins, you know? Like, it's not gonna have that same meaning to you, but it will make perfect sense. But if you've played that first game, this place is haunting. And it's here where we meet the game's true antagonist. At the same time, the one who's been calling out to Klonoa for help this entire time. Meet the King of Sorrow. Now take his design into account here. He's got long flappy ears and he looks a lot like Klonoa. Take into account his facial markings, which much more closely match Klonoa's original design. The one from Door to Phantom Isle. Also take into account that he's got a collar around his neck, which I- Jesus, does that double up as a noose? Let's also look at his facial features though. He doesn't have a nose, he just has a mouth and two eyes. Look at his color scheme, a pale sort of washed out blue, white. This guy is the sorrowful combination of Klonoa and Hupo. Even down to his sort of collar noose thing, also kind of resembling the little halo that was around the bottom of the orb form of Hupo. Take into account the little red rings that he's got around his limbs. Bear in mind that Hupo's cape was red. He's also got these mega tiny pinpoint pupils. Remember how Hupo came from the Moon Kingdom, a place full of stained glass windows and these grand crystalline structures? Well, he's in like this upside down sort of temple with these stained glass windows. There's also the fact that this guy spent his entire life under the veil of Lunatea. Much like how Hupo's entire history with Klonoa was under these veiled false pretenses. This is a work of genius. And this whole story is about the world learning to accept sorrow, to make peace with it. Everyone's got their feelings of regrets in this game. Klonoa regretting the events of Daughter Phantom Isle. Lolo regretting how she was made to feel like she wasn't good enough by the other priestesses, and how she still feels like she's not good enough because she feels like she relied too much on Klonoa's help. Leona regretting the path she chose in life, trying to steal power for herself rather than to earn it. And it all culminates in this beautiful conclusion, with Leona rebuilding the Kingdom of Sorrow. After being a purely destructive force, she's now building this once repressed part of herself which at one stage even overwhelmed her as the final fight you have with Leona is when she's completely overwhelmed by the power of sorrow. Now she's accepted that part of herself and is willing to rebuild it. Lolo has given up being a priestess and wants to try again. She's kind of come to terms with the fact that she doesn't feel right accepting the mantle of priestess when it kind of feels like she did it by accident. She's confronting her own self-image problems and making it right. And now Klonoa, who must once again be pulled out of that world and say goodbye to his friends. Rather than getting sucked in and gripping on for dear life, he walks away off of his own volition with his head held high. Of course, there is a tearful goodbye between him and Lolo. And my god, it's so heartwarming. Klonoa is so gentle with her. I'm so proud of him. And as he walks away, we hear a reprisal of the windmill song from the very first vision of Klonoa daughter Phantom Isle, while the very ground around him ripples and like the credit scene is set to the sort of sea of tears sort of graphic. And the whole thing is that crying can be okay. It's okay to have your sea of tears. You just have to be willing to accept your sorrows and move on. And this time also, rather than reflecting on the previous events of the story like the credits to the first Klonoa game did, they show what became of the world of Lunatea, that the people of these kingdoms now interact with each other, that there is peace in Lunatea. It shows the impact that you've made. If the ending of Klonoa Daughter Phantom Isle was one of the most heartbreaking endings I've ever seen for a video game, the ending for Klonoa Lunatea's Veil vale is one of the most reassuring and heartwarming endings. It feels like a warm hug of an ending. You are given closure for a really heart-wrenching moment in video game history. And after the credits roll, you are greeted to a little good morning message, as though you've woken up from the dream. Klonoa 2, Lunatea's Veil. Vale. How did you do this again? <laughs> How did you manage to have all those layers hidden behind you when I thought I knew them all by now? How did you once again, through this little cabot in a mascot platforming game, 
find a way to make me reflect upon myself. I swear there is a therapeutic quality to these stories. Klonoa is absolutely wonderful. And I have to say, with Klonoa 2, Lunatea's Veil, it feels like a complete story. Between Klonoa Daughter Phantom Hour and Lunatea's Veil, it feels like one complete story. This feels like the quintessential ending. It feels, to be honest, like a perfect place to end the Klonoa franchise. And as of right now, it kind of is the ending. Always has been. Unless you count like the Game Boy games, but as far as the mainline series goes, yeah, this is the ending. With that said, I definitely would like to see more of Klonoa in the future, and I'm really hoping that, like, this isn't going to stop Bandai Namco from giving Klonoa another shot. Not just for remasters, but for a brand new console game, a Klonoa 3. It'll be a challenge, a huge one, but I think with the same people involved, they, they can do it again, I reckon. Like, I, I think the people behind these games, the director of this game as well, still incredibly passionate about Klonoa, and I would love to see what other elements of the human condition they managed to tap into with a Klonoa 3. There's not a single human being in these games. I don't think Lolo's a human. I think, I think she's a monkey. The reason I say it is because she's got a tail. But, like, these games manage to be some of the most human experiences I've ever actually played on a console. This is insane. Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil vale is nothing short of a miracle. It is a perfect sequel. This is absolutely how you continue the Klonoa franchise. I'd love to see more, but if not, we've got two of the greatest games I've ever played right here. And, uh, yeah, I'm just thankful for that. It is hard not to gush over these things, and I really want to note, I'm not some nostalgic person that grew up with Klonoa. I only played Door to Phantom for the very first time last year, and that was it. That was all that I played. That's all she wrote. But I can absolutely see what all the fuss is about. And I must say, I do think that you're getting the most out of these games if you are quite eagle-eyed, if you are quite enthusiastically looking at those storytelling elements. Like, if you're playing this just like a regular platform and you're playing it very casually, barely paying attention to the story, you're not gonna get quite as much out of this franchise as you would if you're actually, you know, being quite eagle-eyed about it. But with that said, yeah. Glow 2, Lunatea's Veil vale is fantastic as is Daughter Phantom Isle, and together these two games make a magnum opus of the mascot platformer subgenre. If for whatever reason you watched the spoiler segment of this review, and you haven't played those games, please, 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 please play them for yourself, because nothing really compares to the experience of just playing these two for yourself and discovering this stuff all for yourself. If you've spoiled yourself, well, that's what it is, but hopefully it will still hit the same. With that being said, what do you think? Which one of the games did you like better? If you did have a favorite, comment below and um, yeah, I, I'd be really enthusiastic to see what you guys have to say. I don't think I'm done with Klonoa just yet. I, I do want to do some videos on like obviously the Fancy Reverie series as a collection. And I would also like to talk a little bit about the Game Boy games if I do get the chance to play them. But the best case scenario is that we end up with a Klonoa 3 that I can talk about, because please. I actually just edited a video over on Nick's channel, uh, Game Apologist, uh, which is Klonoa Speed Reading. I'm, I'm guessing that is up by the time I upload this. So be sure to go check that out because like, he looks into the Klonoa mangas and uh, I had a great time discovering that stuff there as well and seeing what little adventures Klonoa got up to after and even during some of these games. I mean, yeah, they're not as good. Just heads up right now, no, they're nowhere near as good, but like, they're still pretty cool to see. With that being said, good morning. <laughs>